When I was just graduating from high school, um, I was in uh, Hamilton in high school, and uh, the different high schools in Hamilton all had different trades. And that was a big deal in our high schools. And, and I was at a high school that uh, the major focus in the trades was refrigeration and air conditioning. So I took that as a class all the way through high school, two periods a day. It was really kind of like a major focus in high school. Uh, other classes surrounded that and fed into that. I did a co-op through high school. And as soon as I graduated, I got an apprenticeship in refrigeration and air conditioning. Now, this was a long time ago. Please don't ask me to come and look at your fridge because I don't have a clue. <laughs> but I started an apprenticeship uh, in Hamilton. And, and, and the very first day, the boss sat me down with one of their technicians, one of their guys, and said, this, this is Eddie. And you're going to work with Eddie every day through this. And he's going to pour into you. He's going to teach you. You'll work side by side. And everything that Eddie knows and understands and does as a journeyman, he's going to pour into you. I was super excited. Eddie was a guy that around the shop was brimming with confidence. He, he was uh, exuberant and loud and confident. But what I quickly realized that as soon as we got out of the shop and into the field, he had no clue. He really didn't know what he was doing. It was almost embarrassing. And I had, I had just what I had learned in high school. Um, and he was asking me advice, and this was really confusing me. I remember one time... Uh, that we had gone out early in the morning to start installing a central air conditioner in a house. Um, boy, I wish I knew who the, whose house that was now because I still feel like I need to go and apologize. <laughs> because we got there and we had, I, both of us, no idea what we're doing. And he says, drill a hole through the concrete foundation here. And, you know, I was going to start doing that. The boss shows up and changes it to another side of the house. And we had to fix those like it was just a disaster. Imagine, maybe, maybe some of you know this, imagine be in, being in an opportunity where someone is going to pour into you, someone who's the expert, and they're going to pour into your life to bring you up in your skill and your ability in your life, and then you realize that they really don't know what they're doing. Or maybe they're in a really bad spot themselves, or maybe they're just faking it completely. And you end up doing what? Maybe I'll just learn this myself. I can do all the reading. I can watch YouTube videos. I can do all of that kind of stuff. Um, imagine if I had to learn a trade like that completely on my own. You can sit in class and you can do all that kind of stuff. But then I had to install a furnace in somebody's house. Anybody want that guy? What about in your faith? What about in your faith journey? You're trying to follow Jesus, to learn his ways, learn his teaching, understand this, understand God correctly, and nobody is walking alongside with you. Nobody's the one who is pouring into you to understand and to learn and to practice. Have you ever had someone who has done that? Someone who walked with you and talked and taught you and helped you to understand and to learn, maybe help you to, to know God more and more, to understand his ways and his thinking and his kingdom and help you become more and more like Jesus. Have you ever had somebody like that who has done that with you? My guess is 75% of the people in this room never have. And I don't know if that's you or not. But, it, but in a sense, it's kind of like an apprenticeship. An apprenticeship just simply in following Jesus. In the last couple of weeks, uh, we've been looking in a series called Hey, That's Me. And we've looked at three or four already different people or situations in Scripture. Uh, their, 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 their personality types are not necessarily spiritual gifts or passions, but they're just ways that we're wired. The Scripture paints a really nice picture, and you can say, That's me. And God has put all these pieces together so that the church functions well with all different people. And there's lots of things God is asking all of us to do. But there's things that God has specifically created you for to step up in 
to make the whole thing work. And we looked at um, the pool of Bethesda and, and, and how Jesus would go out of his way to go there where all the needy people were. And I know there's people here who, whose heart breaks when people are in need or when they're sick and there's lonely and there's hungry. We talked about that the first week. Last week we talked about Abraham and how he stood before God and, and interceded. And the whole picture is, I know somebody and they have need, but I know God and he has the power. And I am going to be between those two and pull them together. And introduce the need to God and introduce God, the power to the need and pull that together. And there's some of you that are really wired that way. This is something all of us, like the caregiving, all of us need to do. But there's some that God is uniquely wired and given a fire in your heart for that. And we need to be leading and driving in that. The week in between those, we looked at Barnabas and Paul. We looked at Barnabas specifically and how his, his life was encouragement and strengthening others and walking alongside people to helping them to become and, and to, to get settled and in. And, and the specific situation there where he was the advocate of Saul who had just come to Christ. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus. In an, in an incredibly miraculous way, his life changed uh, probably more dramatically in, in the opposite direction than anybody else we, we read about. And how the church in Damascus brought him in and taught him and trained him there and he stayed there for a while. Uh, eventually he went back to Jerusalem where he was from and the church there was terrified because they knew who this guy was. And he, he was the one hunting cr down Christians, arresting them and torturing them and trying to put them to death. And the church wasn't accept accepting him. But Barnabas, Barnabas walked across the room and reached out and became his advocate and brought him into the rest and introduced him to the rest and, and started to work with him. And Barnabas actually made a long-term commitment to Paul. To, to walk alongside him, to pour into him, to grow him spiritually in leadership and in, in, leadership and in depth, like an apprenticeship in, le in the faith and in, and in leading. So we continue that storyline. Barnabas and Paul now are traveling together. And they're preaching and they're teaching and they're supporting the churches. They're starting new churches. And we looked at uh, a couple of weeks ago in Acts chapter 12. They're in Jerusalem. They had gone there from Antioch with a gift for people that were hurting from the famine. And while they're in Jerusalem, they're at a prayer meeting and they meet this young man named Mark. And Mark was a young, solid, godly young man. And they said to him, come with us. In a sense, they said, come, follow me. And they took John Mark and they headed out on their missions trip and planting churches. They were pouring into him and teaching him and training him day after day, doing life together, building him up. Well, Mark had good days and bad days. And Mark eventually gave up and bailed and went back home. Barnabas stuck it out with Mark. Paul, earlier, had gone home had packed his bags and gone home. Barnabas went and found him in Tarsus and brought him back to Antioch to a safe place where he could reestablish and get back and engaged in ministry. And when John Mark had taken off and gone home, Barnabas went and got him. That's in Acts chapter 15. But what a great picture. Anybody here identify with Barnabas in that way? Somebody who really loves to pour into others. You see the potential in others. And you want to pour into them and they're soaking it up like a sponge. Who here loves just to, just to pour into people that way? As a youth pastor, I remember there was lots of times where we would have an adult in our church who really took an interest in a kid and started walking with them and meeting with them and pouring into them and teaching them and training them and guiding them, calling them out on sin, kicking their butts, pushing them along, praying for them, encouraging them. And then I think a lot of those relationships still exist years and years later. Many of you here, um, maybe you're like Paul. Maybe you're like Paul here, eager to learn and grow. You can't get enough about God. You can't stop talking about God. Maybe you're like Mark. 
and, and, and you're a young person who, who is somebody who has brought along in your teaching and training. You have good days, you have bad days. Some of the signif- struggles might be significant, but nobody's giving up on you. Barnabas' involvement in both Paul and in John Mark was long-term. It wasn't just six sessions we'll get together and talk, but it was a major investment in life. A major investment in somebody else's life. Now, Paul was a very, very different type of person. Barnabas was the warm encourager, welcoming. and re- Paul was much, much more abrupt and black and white and aggressive. But Paul starts doing the same thing that Barnabas did for him. If you have your Bible, go to Acts chapter 15. We're going to go right at the very end of 15. We were here a couple of weeks ago. Right at the end of Acts chapter 15, this is where um, they had been on their trip with John Mark with them. And it talks here about um, John Mark had gone home. And in verse 39, they were ready to go back out again on the next trip. And Barnabas wants to bring Mark. And Paul is saying, not a chance. He's bailed once, done with him. And their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas. And as he left, left, believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care, and he traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. And now we're chapter 16. Paul, now with Silas, went through Derbe and then to Lystra. And in Lystra, there was a young disciple named Timothy. His mother was Jewish, a Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. Timothy uh, was well thought of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium. So Paul wanted him to join them on his journey. Do you see what's happening there? Paul now is doing this all over again with another young man. What do we know about Timothy? Timothy was the son of a Jewish woman. Her name was a Eunice. She was a believer. But she had married a Greek man. And there's no mention of him anywhere else in the Bible except right here. Um, a Jewish woman marrying a Greek man was not normal. Like today's world, interracial, interreligious marriages are, are pretty common. We think big deal. But in this world, that was not normal. And so Timothy, I won't get into all the story of that today, but you can read on and find that Timothy, uh, growing up as a Gentile with a Jewish mother, uh, had a lot of trouble fitting into the Jewish community. And, and we won't get into that, but um, we see here and in 2 Timothy chapter 1 that it appears that Timothy grew up uh, just with the care of his mother and his grandmother, who were both Christians, and they taught him the scripture. But look at verse 4. Here, here we've got Paul comes to meet them. He sees this young man with great potential, and everybody's speaking so highly of him. And what does Paul say? Hey, come with me. Come with me. I'll teach you, I'll train you, the same thing, the same pattern. Verse 4, when they went from town to town, instructing the believers to follow the the decisions made by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in their faith and grew larger every day. And Paul and Silas, and of course Timothy, gathered, uh, traveled through the area of uh, Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then continuing to the borders of Mysia, and they headed north to Bithynia. But again, the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there, so instead they went through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded, concluded that God was calling us to preach there. Do you imagine the things that Timothy was learning? Just as they're going day to day, and, and all of a sudden, they're, they're going and they're preaching and the plan is to go here and the Holy Spirit stops them and they listen and they change their direction and then Paul has a vision. He, can you just even remotely imagine the conversations that Paul and Silas and Timothy would be having about what God is doing, how God is leading them? You think of all of the things that Timothy is learning here um, as they traveled together. They went through Galatia, Corinth, Philippi, Colossae, Thessalonica, all of these are, are, are books of our Bible, the letters to those churches. 
And then they went through Ephesus, and eventually it was Ephesus that Paul sent Timothy to to be the pastor in that church. And so uh, what we've got is we've got Barnabas who pours into Paul. And Barnabas, who pours into Mark, bringing them up, leading them, traveling with them, living with them day in and day out. And then we have Paul, who begins to do that same thing with Silas. And then Paul's doing that same thing with Timothy. Where do you think they got this idea from? Where did this plan come from? Where did this model, this apprenticeship model of training come from? Any idea? Jesus, yeah. There is a really, really intentional, relational apprenticeship to following Jesus, to living in faith. There's a, it was a really close relationship. In 1 Timothy, Paul calls Timothy his son in the faith. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul talks about how uh, I, I didn't even just give you the word. I gave you my life. I treated you like my family. And this is the way Paul mentored Timothy. We can also look through scripture and we can see really clearly the things that Paul taught Timothy. He taught him uh, his way of living. Day in and day out is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He talks about the way he's living in a manner worthy of the Lord. And And Paul challenged Timothy to live the same. He says to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But be an example for the believers in life and speech and love and faith and purity. Uh, Paul, um, Paul doesn't just walk with him and show him and teach him. But after Timothy settles in Ephesus and begins to do those same things with other people as Timothy uh, in Ephesus, um, Paul continues to write him letters. And we've got the letters of First and Second Timothy. And, and even in these letters, he's talk, Paul is teaching him about heresy and ungodly living. He's teaching him about the battle and battling for what is right. There's lots of theological depth. He encourages him to stand strong in his faith. He talks about spiritual warfare and prayer and appropriate dress and leadership. He talks about running a church, uh, how to treat elders and, and widows how to choose leadership. He talks about how to, how to preach with fervor and conviction and, 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 and patience. So even when Timothy is older and, and leading a church and mentoring other people, Paul is still involved in his life and still encouraging him and teaching him and training him. It was a lifelong commitment. Pouring into by example practical day-by-day training and teaching and visits and letters to become the great church leader that Timothy became. So, who here is kind of like Paul in that part of the story? Where you can, you, you, you see Timothy's potential and, and you're, you're moved, you're, you're, you're invested, you invest your whole heart to pour into that person over the long haul. Has God placed younger believers in your life that you can pour into like that and encourage and guide like Paul did with Timothy, but like Barnabas did with Paul? Maybe you're here today and you're saying, I, I, I'm like more like Timothy. Actually, I want to be like Timothy. I'd love it if somebody would take me aside and give me that level of interest and time and energy and pour into me and teach me and train me. Show me how it works, how my faith comes to life. Help me understand. How do, how do I live this? Teach me how to pray. Encourage me, challenge me, be patient with me. I want to be apprentice in the ways of Jesus. Maybe some of you are going, ah, I want to be like Timothy. Okay, go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. On my Bible, it's page 961. Probably that won't help any of you. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy is one of the letters that Paul wrote to Timothy. And he's so clear in here. He's talking a little bit about uh, his, his, their relationship at the beginning. He calls him his son in verse 2. 
He says, night and day in verse 3, night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again because I remember your tears when we parted. And I'm filled with joy when we're together. Do you have those relationships with people? He talks about Eunice and Lois, his mother and his grandmother. Um, he starts talking about holding on to the pattern of, holding te- uh, uh, of wholesome teaching that you learned from me, a pattern shaped by Jesus, a truth that was entrusted to Timothy. When you come to chapter 2, this is what it says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Jesus Christ. You've heard, you have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. That is an absolutely critical verse in our scripture. Here's the cool thing. The same way that Paul pulled Timothy out and poured into him, he is charging Timothy to do that same thing with others. What's, uh, that's an expectation on Timothy. Timothy. This is exactly what Timothy begins to do. You can see what Paul did with Timothy, right? Where did Paul learn to do that? From who? From Barnabas. Where did Barnabas learn to do that? I haven't told you this. Anybody know? It's in Acts chapter 4. It was Peter and John that did this in Barnabas' life. Where did Peter and John learn that from? From Jesus. You see, uh, this is exactly what Jesus did with his 12. It's exactly. What did Jesus do with his 12? He called them to follow him, to come with me. Travel, learn, live together, day by day doing life together. He modeled. He was an example. He taught them. He pulled them aside and explained. He taught them how to pray now, they knew God. They were Jewish. But, but there was a misunderstanding of God, and he spent so much time saying, here is the kingdom of God. This is what God is like, so that they understood it. They knew it. And he sent them out over and over. He sent them out to, to preach, to heal the sick, to cast out demons. But how did Jesus invest the bulk of his ministry time? With the ones he called. Then right at the end of Jesus' life on earth, Matthew chapter 8, 28, Jesus sits down with them and said, Now, God has given me all authority on earth. Go and make disciples. Baptize them. Teach them the things I've taught you. Teach them to obey those things. This was not a stretch for them. This was not outside their character. This wasn't a a weird thing or a new idea or strange in any way. This was the discipleship process. Now, I want to stop and take a second here to talk about this. If you've been here for the last five years, you've heard me talk about this four times. I promise you, every year I am with you, I will bring this up again because this is important. 2,000 years ago in ancient Israel, there was a process of discipleship. It was school. Started at five years old. The five, six, seven-year-olds in class with a rabbi. In those two or three years, they would learn the Torah. They would learn Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That much of the Bible, word for word, memorized by the time they were seven. As they walked with the the rabbi, as they went, he would teach them math and geography, probably not algebra, but normal stuff. <laughs> They'd go to the market, and he would buy things, and he'd, he'd teach them as they exchanged money, and, and it was part, it was their whole school. But the focus for boys and girls, five to seven years old, was learn the, the first five books of our Bible off by heart. At the end of uh, that, uh, I guess it was around 10 years old at that point, there would be a cut. The best students would go on, the other ones were done. And from 10 to 12 years old, the boys and girls left would be separated. The boys would learn the oral traditions. 
Uh, and, and the girls would learn the Psalms and the Proverbs, and then that was the end of education for the girls. At 12 years old, there was another cut. The best of the best boys were in, invited to stay. The other ones went home to their, to their families and learned to become fishermen or carpenters or blacksmiths or whatever their family trade was. At 12 to 13 years old, now boys only, they would learn the writings and the prophets. So by the time they were tw 13 years old, they would know the entire Old Testament word for word off by heart. But at this point, their education, uh, one of the huge focus was not just learning the material, but full interaction with the material. A good way to describe that would be, um, and this is the way ancient uh, Israel teaching would be, if the teacher said to you, what's two times two? Four, good, okay, just checking. That would not be an okay answer for the student to give. The student would have to answer something like, what is 16 divided by four? So you know the answer is four, but it also proves they know the answer, but they know how to use it and make it work. Does that make sense? Full integration with the material. And that would be the expectation by the time they're 13 years old. Between 15 and 16 years old, there's usually only a few student, students left. And at that point, the rabbi would come to one, the best of the best of the best students, and he would say this, come follow me, take my yoke upon you. And that one would be invited into a relationship that would last the next 14 years till he was 30, to become exactly like his rabbi in every way. So this was the way the rabbi would replicate himself, his style of teaching, his way of interacting with people, his knowledge of scripture. He would pour into these young men so well, and, and then one or two of them till they were 30. Then th at that point, the absolute expectation was, is now that person is a rabbi, and he's collecting a bunch of kids and starting that whole thing again. In the way of that rabbi. Does that make sense? Folks, that is what a disciple is. So here's Jesus. He's walking along the beach, and he sees two fishermen. They're rejects from the system. And he says, come follow me. That was the highest calling in their culture. No boy would turn that down. They had no idea what they're getting into. The calling was to be a disciple, to become exactly like their rabbi. Folks, become like Jesus. In every way, in every way, this was the expectation. So you see what Jesus did? Jesus was asking his followers to do the same in Matthew chapter 28. Go and make disciples. You're graduates now. In the way of Jesus, make disciples. Now, what happened as that turned over into the book of Acts, and we continue through the book of Acts, they took him seriously. Peter and John, we got examples of them doing that. Barnabas does it, and then Barnabas with, with Paul, and then with Mark, and then Mar Paul with Silas, and, and with um, Timothy and others. They called them to be with them to develop them over the long haul, to become an authentic follower of Jesus, to grow into the person that God created them to be, to step up into their calling, to be knowledgeable, skilled, resilient, and rock solid. I hope I've made this obvious. This was Jesus' plan in Matthew 28. This is what he's saying. Can you see how Paul is doing that he's teaching there's information there's understanding there's thinking there's knowing and there's modeling and there's example and living it and doing it and breathing it and becoming and then picking it up and starting to serve and partner and repeating the process this is discipleship when i was growing up i think i really misunderstood the word discipleship because maybe you were like me but what i thought it meant was when someone gives their heart to Jesus, there's a four or five or six week little course they go through and we call that discipleship. Folks, if that's your idea, please erase that. Because discipleship is a lifelong process that actually starts before you know Jesus because it includes the invitation to come and follow. 
It's a calling to walk alongside others for the long haul to become solid, effective, vibrant followers of Jesus. Disciples. So let me ask, are you a disciple? Are you a disciple who makes disciples? Because that's what Jesus was asking when he said, come follow me. You know that Jesus was saying more than just come and follow me. The assumption is come follow me, take my yoke, become fishers of men, disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, that verse I read before. You've heard me... Teach things that I have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to you. Look at this. You, he says, that's generation two, heard me, generation one, tell reliable men, that's generation three, who will teach others, that's generation four. Discipling takes a believer at any stage in their growth and shepherds him or her through a continual process of learning and doing, even after they're qualified and they're doing it with other people. What's the way we do this? To know God. To know God more and more and more and more. To become like Jesus more and more and more, and then changing the world through him. So I asked here a few minutes ago, who is like Paul here? Who wants to be a Timothy? The truth is, there's no difference. Because Timothy was doing exactly the same thing as Paul. Both are the same here. A disciple who makes disciples who makes disciples. This is Jesus' plan for the world. It's something we need to get together. How many of you, this is, a, a, this is an actual question, I'd love you to put your hand up. How many of you have actually experienced that in your life? Folks, this is Jesus' plan for the church. And I think this is the problem why the church is dying in North America. Because we're not doing this. And this doesn't need to be a program that we schedule on Tuesday nights and we put you with you and you with you. This is all of us as a disciple of Christ. This is what it means. And we need to get it in gear. Here's what I think. I would love it if every single one of us had somebody who was ahead of us in the journey that was pouring into us and, and, and praying for us and walking alongside us. Someone who's invested in us. We all need that. But we all need to have someone behind us in the journey that we are praying for and we are investing in. And folks, if we were doing that just as individuals, with or without any kind of program, this whole thing would rock. Because this is Jesus' plan. Please don't expect your pastors to do all of this. Look at all of the things we look for in this series. The caregiving and the praying and the encouraging and, and the bringing, connecting people and all of these things. Please don't expect your pastors to do all of that. There's no way that will happen. But folks, this isn't just a little small group. It's not just a six-week discipleship course. This is real, deep, long-term investment in life. It requires us to give somebody permission to climb inside my head and my heart and kick around. It requires us uh, to, to go deep and long-term, pouring into each other, challenging each other, calling out sin, teaching and modeling and doing it together that through the ups and downs, year after year after year investing. This is what Jesus has asked us to do. So this whole series, I think, the Hey, this, That's Me series is for us is really critical. 
I think it's really, it's important to me. Uh, we started it off a few weeks ago talking about there's no deck chairs on this boat. This is something for all of us. I think all of these things, the caregiving and the Barnabas and the Abraham and the Timothy, and next week we'll talk about Andrew. Uh, all of these things are things for, that all of us need to be doing. But God has wired some of us very specifically with a fire for these things. Then let's get going. Because if that's you, then you need to lead us and set the pace and get these processes going. All of us, disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you set this pace. You set this direction. You modeled it for us. We can just simply read through what you did and know exactly what we ought to be doing. Thank you for the clarity in that. Thank you for the challenge and the call. Thank you for the commandment to do that if we are your followers. Father, I pray that you would stir in our hearts, that you would light a fire in us for this, that this is something that would just become ha begin happening so naturally because we're following Jesus. But God, for some of us, we really need to be pushed. So God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to move, to challenge, to strengthen. And God, would you begin to, to put names in our hearts and our minds? Would you bring people together that we might begin to really pour into each other as we journey together? Fellowship is like journeying with a whole bunch of ships together. The advantage of that are, are incredible. The Titanic had been in a fellowship or a few ships around it. God, what a difference that would have made. But God, there's no room here for us to travel alone. Would you bring us into discipleship with each other? In Jesus' name, amen.